Hi, my name is Jason and this is my first ever listicle video. So I'm pretty excited. I'm going to talk about five things that I wish I would have understood when I started building this home studio. I'm an indie folk musician. I record a lot of acoustic instruments, electric guitars and bass and vocals in this room. And of course, there are links for my original music in the description below. Thing number one, and these are kind of in order of importance. You really need to start to understand the difference between engineering mode and performance mode in your brain. Especially when you're starting to build your studio, you're really going to be obsessed with the engineering aspects of your studio and whether or not you're capturing the right thing. And I'm telling you, if you're thinking about that kind of stuff when you're actually performing, your performance is not going to be as good. When you're setting up to record yourself, Sure, do some experiments and listen back, but then when you're actually decided, okay, this is my setup, I'm going to do this, you really need to try to push all of that engineering stuff out of your brain and tell yourself, I'm performing now. One of the classic examples would be that you're worried about pushing the levels too high. Don't push your gain levels so high that you need to worry about it and you need to keep an eye out for a red light that might be peaking. Just turn the thing down and perform without worrying about that. And so when you do find a process that is working for you, I would suggest you stick with it. Obviously, you still want to keep experimenting, but there's a certain value in just having your notes, following the process, and just being relaxed about, hey, I know what I'm doing here, and keeping your mind on the performance. Number two, which hardware do we really need? The mic is really important and the interface is really important. All of the stuff in between that, the rack of analog hardware, I think is completely optional at this stage of technology development. I'm not saying that's bad stuff, it's great stuff, but there are plugins now which are also great. And this is where you're gonna get a difference of opinion between the person who started the studio 30 years ago and the person who's starting the studio now, because 30 years ago, the plugins weren't as good. So they're going to swear by the analog gear. And I just don't think that's true anymore. And there's plenty of award-winning producers who will say, yeah, the plugins are great. So don't get tied up in knots thinking that it's not sounding right because you don't have a piece of analog gear, but you do need upgraded plugins, which I'm going to get to in a second. I'm just going to reiterate the microphone is really important. Buy the best microphone you can afford. The interface is also really important. The interface is the one thing that's going to turn your analog signal into to a digital signal and then everything else is going to depend on the quality of that conversion. So I think it really pays off to have a higher quality converter as you can get. When you're just starting out you're probably not going to be able to hear the difference but I think in a few years if you learn to pay attention to the details you will be able to tell the difference between low and high quality converters. Now I alluded to the plug-in so that's going to be number three. Definitely get the upgraded plugins. This is something that I didn't really understand at the first because I thought it's just software. I'm a Logic Pro user. Why wouldn't Apple produce all of the best plugins as part of their Logic Pro? And what I eventually started to realize is that the best plugins, especially reverb plugins, they soak up a lot of CPU. And Apple probably doesn't want their Logic Pro to cause computer crashing and things like that. So the best plugins need to be paired with appropriate amount of CPU hardware to make them run well. There are lots of options for that. I'm not going to recommend anything in particular. I use a UAD satellite box, which is an, an additional eight cores sitting beside my computer to run plugins. The plugin that you're going to notice the biggest difference on, probably a reverb, but I think some of the guitar amps, the upgraded plugins do sound nicer there as well. Although sometimes the stock plugins for guitar amps do sound good too. So I mentioned the reverb, so that's going to be number four. I think you really need to understand what reverb is. It's sound bouncing around in a room. When we hear things naturally, we hear them in a context and we always hear the room in conjunction with hearing the actual thing. So when we want to do a mix, we need to understand how to use reverb to place them on a stage illusion within the mix. Now, sometimes that stage illusion is not going to be the same kind of space as the space you're recording in. So if your microphone ears are in a room, which is different than the room you're trying to create the illusion of the stage, then you need to think about, am I capturing my room sound 
in a way that's going to impair my ability to mix. And so the first example, and this is one that I struggled with for a while, especially with an acoustic guitar, it would quickly bounce off the floor or the wall and come back to my microphone and I would have these quick echoes. And it didn't sound bad when I listened back to just the recording of that guitar, but I could never get it a nice smooth sound like it was sitting in a mix, which probably that kind of recording is more done in a big room and any reverb is nice and soft. There's no hard slap back echo coming off a nearby wall or floor, which is more applicable to recording in a small room. So if you are going to record in a small room, you either need to do enough sound control to prevent the slap back echo or dynamic microphone picks up less room noise than a condenser microphone. I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail of either the room treatment or the dynamic versus condenser mic. I think those are separate topics. They're worthy of entire videos on their own and this video would just get too long. Number five, let someone else mix you. There's lots of people who are offering mixing services at various levels of development and price levels. There's a lot of advantages to getting someone else to mix you. One, it allows you to just focus on the recording stuff and you don't get distracted by the mixing. Mixing is a discipline onto itself. And I'm not saying you should never learn anything about mixing. A little bit of mixing knowledge is good. But I think getting someone else to mix you gives you an objective set of ears on your recording. And especially if they have a little bit more of experience than you, then they can also help you do better recordings in the first place. They can say things like, hey, I hear a lot of slapback echo in your acoustic guitar recording. Could you maybe try recording that in a different way? It would save you up front from exploring all of the complications of upgraded plugins because the plugins are really for mixing. You don't really need them for the tracking stage. It helps to have the plugins to listen to what you're doing in the context of how it would be mixed and helps you understand, did you get it right? But ultimately you can get away without plugins at the tracking stage and just leave that for the mixer. So that's it. That's five things that I wish I would have understood and I hope that helps you in building out your home studio. My original music links are in the description below. Lots of guitars, banjos, good lyrics. So thanks a lot and good luck with your studio build.